welcome to No Franchise Fatigue, the monthly podcast where we, Sean and myself, get together and talk about giant monstrous movies that have sequels, prequels, remakes, and, you know, American versions in the case of what we're talking about today. But this podcast is dedicated to looking at the themes and styles of various franchises as we dig into various eras of those to talk about, you know, just why these franchises exist. And we're going to be digging deep for this one to find out why this giant monstrous franchise has decided to cross the sea. And if I say giant monstrous again, uh, are you getting that, Sean? Are you getting what I'm saying? Giant monstrous? Should it's- it- Saying, that's what they say in comedy, right? It's the rule of threes. It's the rule It'll of threes. Just keep I'm saying it. Say oh, you know what? Maybe it's because I'm not saying it. Uh, I'm, maybe it's because I'm saying it in English. Maybe I should say it's a kaiju franchise. Mm. Giant monster franchise <laughs> we're talking about today. Did, I almost pulled a hamstring running for that joke, by the way. As I just <laughs> really point that out there. But, <laughs> and I've already introduced you before I even introduced myself. I am your co-host for the evening. My name is Matthew Reifschneider, and I am joined by my giant monster-loving co-host. I'm just going to keep saying it at this point. Sean Kaler. How are you doing tonight, Sean? I'm doing very, very good. A little uh, disappointed you didn't have your normal portmanteau in the, uh, in the intro of remakewals, because we're actually dealing with one for once. Oh my A god, I... Sequel. Oh my god, we need to re-record this. I gotta throw in remakewal. It is a remakewal. We have a remakewal going. Well, okay. So before we get too deep into this, guys, we're talking about American Godzilla films today. So thing with the Hanna Barbera cartoon, Godzilla yeah. da, 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 and Godzuki. No. Yeah, well, I do not. I honest to God. All right, we're already gonna be stepping into a tangent here. <laughs> There is an upcoming Scooby-Doo animated movie that was just announced it's going straight to streaming called Scoob Mm -hmm. that has a bunch of Hanna-Barbera cartoon characters in it. If Godzuki shows up into it, automatic five stars. (laughs) Five stars. Don't care. I was 50-50 on if you were going to end that sentence with positivity or riot. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, more than likely, it's going to make a couple of scrappy jokes. So Scrappy, automatic one star. Godzuki shows up, automatic five stars. That averages out to three. So we'll just call it good. Scrappy is yes. a piece of shit. Godzuki is the... awesome. Godzilla is a world-spanning franchise. And we're going to be going to a lot of different places when we talk about these American Godzilla films. And uh, starting it off, we should, we should probably talk a little bit about our relationship with Godzilla. So I want to know, Sean... Are you and Godzilla getting along at this time in your lives? Oh, better than ever, really. Um, I actually recently saw Shin Godzilla for the first time in a theatrical setting at a revival screening in L.A. about four, five, six months ago, something like that. Um, Oh, boy, that movie's great. That movie is capital G great. But my relationship with Godzilla is near on life spanning um when i was young and they used to just kind of play b movies on sci-fi all day back when it was spelled right um (laughs) and also simultaneously kind of in the era of vhs rental like blockbuster i used to just rent everyone i could get my hands on i didn't know there was a rhyme reason order to any of them um, didn't realize that till I was much further into my adult life and I've never actually given them a proper like sequential watch. So a lot of my old Godzilla knowledge is like super scattershot, but I have grown up loving the franchise regardless. Um, particularly the sixties and seventies, I believe they call it the Showa era or is yes. that the Toho? No, Toho is the studio. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Showa. You're good. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then I I just want to point out that you made a joke about sci-fi channel previously. And in my head, I have always thought that when they made that shift over, they got this board together and the guy said, we need 
to change the name of our channel. And, and, he, and it was just dead silent for a few minutes. And then someone goes, why? And he was like, that's it? We're going to yeah. change it to wise. And that was the end of that. That's story. how we ended up with Siffy, yes. So that's cool. So, I mean, obviously you grew up with Godzilla. I and myself in the same way. I grew up watching Godzilla movies since I was a little kid. Adore the series. I have seen probably every Godzilla movie half dozen times. Uh, for this watch, I rewatched Godzilla King of the Monsters, the most recent one. I believe that's my fourth or fifth watch for this movie already. So uh, we're I'm getting up there, getting this one back on uh, track with the rest of them. But I've seen all of them. And it was enough so that Godzilla was such a big part of my childhood and, and, and my life as a, as a film fan and things like that, that growing up, my brother and I even had a term for when other movies did something with like science mumbo jumbo, we refer to it as G science, which means Godzilla science, because in Godzilla <laughs> movies, they always come up with these bullshit science terminologies that don't actually make any sense, but they make sense in the narrative and that's okay. Um, so if you hear me use the term G science, that's because that's a familial term uh, in my family that we use to express what I would refer to as dumb, but incredible uh, circumstances within a movie for an explanation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one, I think it is worth just for the sake of King of Monsters, touching on a little bit um, that when I was young, I didn't particularly discern between the kaiju either. I was always disappointed when I rented a movie and, you know, like Godzilla didn't show up. But I did also have like a weird love for um, Rodan, which we have talked about before. Um, I don't know if on recording, but we have talked about, I just, I do weirdly love Rodan, all of his m movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get to Rodan here because Rodan is a character in the movies that we're going to be talking about. And just for our audience to know, we will be talking spoilers for all four of the movies that we'll be talking about today. Uh, we're only doing four as there's only four American Godzilla films at this point. Uh, one of them what we're talking about today is technically not a Godzilla film, but we're going to uh, get there in a second. But, you know, we're going to be talking about spoilers today. So please, if you are, you know, offended by the fact that we're going to be dropping parts and talking about these franchises as a whole and you don't want things spoiled, please pause the recording now. Uh, go check out the four films that we're going to be talking about today, which includes Godzilla, the 1998 version. We're going to be talking about Godzilla, the 2014 version. We're going to be talking about Kong, Skull Island. And we're going to be talking about the newest film, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. So those are the four we'll be talking about. Spoilers galore. We're going to be talking about a lot of weird shit. I've got a lot of things to say about all of these films as a massive, lifelong Godzilla fan. And I'm happy to get going on this one. we got a lot of ground to cover. And we are we are brushing past it a little bit because um, we'll touch on it when we touch on it. But we're also dipping our toes into King Kong territory, and that's a whole other thing. It is a whole other thing, and we definitely when we get to Kong Skull Island, I have a lot of things to say about this, particularly because King Kong, like Godzilla, shares a, a big part in my heart in my childhood uh, growing up. In fact, my mother loves to tell the story, but when I was a little kid, like four or five, while all of my friends were watching The Lion King on repeat and repeat on VHS, I was watching the original King Kong, the black and white one, uh, over again on repeat and repeat when I was like four or five. I was obsessed with it. So it's one of those things that kaiju... Uh, which is the Japanese term for giant monster, is something that is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm very excited to be talking. Even if it's the American ones, I get it, I get it. It's a good place for us to start um, and kind of start no. this conversation. My my last note before, and I will roll smoothly into our first movie, which is 1998 Godzilla, so brace yourselves. But um, <laughs> That's a lot of fish. My last note, yeah, that's a lot of fish. Um my my only like weird thing with King Kong would be the last movie I saw before theaters shut down for this whole quarantine epidemic was actually a revival screening of the original King Kong, um, fully restored. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I definitely cherish getting to see that in theaters. 
Yeah, I'm I'm jealous. I didn't get to uh, go see that screening. I've seen King Kong uh, before in theaters, but not that new restoration, which I do hear is just phenomenal. So hopefully, when theaters reopen, we get to see some more of those old films come back. So yeah. yeah. But anyway, said I would roll seamlessly into this Godzilla 1998, if we can call it that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He's not Godzilla. Thank you very much. His name is Zilla. So. <laughs> So, basically, the plot goes a little something like this. An iguana nest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> calm yourself. Bring yourself to a calm center. Do some yoga. An iguana nest is hit by nuclear testing. 30 years later, it turns into a Godzilla-like monster that terrorizes New York. So it seems like a really simplistic setup and unusual for a Godzilla movie. I'm kind of brushing past the human plot there because here's the thing. Instead of being what we would consider a standard Godzilla movie and a standard Godzilla formula, this is 100% Roland Emmerich movie with Godzilla instead of... Uh, earthquake or whatever the hell he's doing nowadays. Uh, earthquake with a face. I earthquake. <laughs> I he just know. does a lot of disaster films now. It's like it, he he did Stargate and then a bunch of crap. Like I feel completely juked by I feel completely juked by Roland Emmerich in my life because I have never liked another movie of his. That's actually weird but true. So our cast of Silly Roland Emmerich characters include Matthew Broderick as Nick Totopoulos, whose apparently impossible to pronounce last name is their attempt at a Ronin joke in this movie. I think the first out and out American role for Jean Reno. Oh, uh, that might be. I actually then, don't know. I feel like I feel like he's been part of my life also since childhood. So <laughs> professional. Mm -hmm. But um, it's uh, got Hank Azaria um, in a rare live-action appearance. And basically, um, Nick Totopoulos is this uh, scientist who is studying the effect of radiation on creatures. They realize they've got a giant irradiated creature. They bring him in to study it. Um, Godzilla rampages around the city, has some eggs... They have to fight baby Godzillas. They destroy Madison Square Garden. And then they kill big Godzilla. And then in one of the most really tragic sequel bait grabs of all time, one of the babies survives. And that's really the movie. Did I miss any major beats here? I don't know. Every time I watch this movie, I fall asleep. So I'm for a movie that is like two hours and 20 minutes of essentially pure action. I, this movie bores the living hell out of me. So you might've missed something. I, I, let's be honest. As you started to describe the plot, I also fell asleep. So, <laughs> so other jokes that don't work. Um, the mayor and the mayor's aide are basically Siskel and Ebert because, uh, because <laughs> our boy had a little axe to grind with their review of his last movie before this, which I believe was Independence Day. Yes, should have been Independence Day, because essentially that was the reason he got this job. So they were, he was kind of in pre-development on it, and then that exploded. So, Oh, wait, shit. He did 13th Floor and Eight-Legged Freaks. Those, uh, I like those okay. I won't lie. Wait, did he direct them? I don't think he directed those. Just produced those. Never mind. Yeah, yep. no, fuck them. No, fuck <laughs> <laughs> no, but, okay. So maybe we should start there. Maybe we should start with Roland Emmerich. So because, as you mentioned, Godzilla 98 is less of a Godzilla film and more of a Roland Emmerich film. And that is both probably a smart idea and a terrible idea at the same time. Um, yeah, no, I mean, just coming off of ID4, which I'm personally not a fan of, although do know people that ride or die with that movie for some reason. Um, regardless, 
it, there's no denying it was a runaway success. I mean, that was the movie to emulate. Yeah, and his style is all over this film. Now, this leads to a lot of the problems with Godzilla 98. Um, well, because he doesn't have characters. He has caricatures. Um, he has big cartoony jokes. It's basically... Michael Bay with a slightly less male gaze and way fewer Dutch angles. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And what's funny is like when we, and when you talk about like modern action cinema, I mean, Michael Bay's name comes up a lot, but we owe a lot to Roland Emmerich. And as you mentioned, ID four was a big hit. It was big. And like you said, people are ride or die for that movie. Now, Give us Will Smith. And I mean, I know he was in movies before and he had his rap career and he had Fresh Prince, but let's just be honest. ID4 was Will Smith. For sure. For sure. And and ID4 solidified a lot of the things that he was toying with in, in earlier films like Stargate or Universal Soldier with these kind of uh, big, bold characters and things like that. Um, but like you said, caricatures. I also- and so- you love Universal Soldier, but it predates Stargate, so my statement still holds true. Yes, this is true. This is true. No, I, I agree. I actually like, I don't mind his early films. I do love Universal Soldier, and I, I actually really like Stargate. But, you know, after that, he gets so obsessed with this idea of, of visually showing destruction and things like that, that that's why, and it, and you can see why when this when Sony TriStar decided, you know what, we got the rights to Godzilla, we're going to, we've been trying to make this movie since 1990. Right. A t- oh. slew of different directors had been attached to this film at one point. Originally, I believe uh, they offered it to James Cameron um, and to direct. He passed on it. It was offered to Tim Burton, who passed on it. Um, I've even heard that Paul Verhoeven at one point was offered it and he passed on it. Um, you know, and then eventually it went to a different director who started to um, I can't think of his name right now. Um, uh, Jan de Bont. Um, I, hopefully I said his name correctly, um, but he's the one that kind of got it into it. And then he wanted to make it even bigger budget film kind of deal. Um, and then the studio wanted to pull back on it and they ended up giving it to Roland Emmerich um, simply because of the success of ID four and, and some of his earlier films, but it kind of makes sense for him to do this. He's known for destruction. Uh, we're going to have a giant monster in a city in New York city. It makes sense for him to make this film. Now, on paper, this makes sense. And then you watch the movie and you realize that it's very obvious that, number one, not only did he not like Godzilla films, he didn't want to make a Godzilla film. He has no interest in making a Godzilla film. So He wanted to make a disaster film. In, in which he does. And, and it's interesting because throughout this movie, you get a lot. He has a fun visual style, similar to Michael Bay in a lot of ways. Um but in this movie, his visual style almost doesn't make sense. And we'll get to this a little bit when they reboot Godzilla again in 2014. But, you know, there's all these things that he saw or didn't see in Godzilla films because he, he very much expressed that beforehand that he did not like Godzilla movies before he made this. But he makes a lot of bold choices in this movie that, could have paid off but don't including godzilla himself the design being more of an iguana which i don't inherently disagree with but i see what they were trying to do but for one i mean it's just not especially intimidating um i think that comes from being just a hair skewing a hair too God, this is stupid to say. Skewing a hair too realistic, and you right. lose a little bit of the intimidation factor of him. Um, it doesn't really have like the nuclear breath and some of this other stuff, for one. Um, for two, this is just a note I've had since I saw this movie the first time as a child in theaters, and I'm just glad to say it out loud. Man, the baby Godzillas in this movie are just reused raptor animations. It's literally the same as the raptor from Jurassic Park. Well, and that brings up a good point, because not only is Godzilla 98 a movie that is in the wake of Independence Day, 
and getting Roland Emmerich to do another film of destruction where American landmarks, which this movie does have uh, a lot of shots of the Twin Towers, mm-hmm. which is really interesting now in, in kind of a post 9-11 world. But not only is he doing a destruction of kind of the landmarks again, um, the Chrysler building gets blown up in this and things like that. But this is also a movie that's coming in the wake of Jurassic Park. And its influence is felt everywhere in this movie. By this point, I think even Lost World had been out. Oh, for sure. And you you feel all of that influence in this movie. And the baby Godzilla. So in terms of the plot, right, you have Godzilla that shows up. He's heading to New York for some undisclosed reason. We have all these humans that are trying to chase him down and figure out what he is and everything like that. He goes through Panama because I guess to get to New York, you, you know, as a, as a water creature, as an amphibian, you would go through the Panama canal. He goes over there and he goes to New York. You find out that he, that he, which they continually refer to Godzilla as a he, but it's obviously asexual is going there to nest and lay eggs. Right. And so then you have like this third act that's, outside of a final chase sequence is completely dedicated to baby Godzilla's and hundreds of them. So it was like, they were like, they saw Jurassic park and they're like, yeah, the Raptor scene is so scary. Let's do that. But instead of two Raptors, it's a hundred Raptors. And instead of square garden. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And instead of a kitchen, it's in Madison square garden where one character even stops and is like, hold on. This is where the Knicks shower. He makes a joke about it. And you're like, wow, that's still not funny. Um, the, like you said, the jokes in this movie fall flat so much. And there's so many of them. It tries so hard to be funny. And, it's and just... it has so many talented comedians in it. That's the really shocking part. Yeah, right. But this movie tries so hard to be more like a Jurassic Park film, a disaster film with Jurassic Park elements than it does to be a Godzilla film, um, which is fascinating because supposedly when... Toho, which is the studio that created the Japanese Godzilla, sold the rights to Sony TriStar to make this film. They gave Sony TriStar a reportedly 75-page dossier on what they can and cannot do with Godzilla. Hmm. And reportedly, Sony TriStar completely ignored all of it. Yeah, I presume so. So, including one of their things was Godzilla cannot die in the movie. That's what's reported. And then, nonetheless... They kill Godzilla at the end of this movie. <laughs> and then, as you said, they do the sequel bait with the little raptor, with the with the raptor egg that busts open. And you see the little Godzilla pop out. I don't know. I guess, like, for me, this movie as a doesn't work as a Godzilla film simply because it doesn't feel like a Godzilla movie. No, it's um, it's kind of a fun, rollicking adventure for Matthew Broderick and his crew of weirdos. Including, like, a French operative and, like, a news cameraman. And they're just going around trying to stop but also study and respect this creature. And it's also got, like, this environmental message. And it just... It's it's very confused and it's very confusing. But it's also cynical. And it's a cynical cash grab. Um, I don't feel like you can talk about this movie without mentioning the marketing blitz surrounding it. Which was unbelievable. I I still, I mean, to this day, I cannot, I can't think of another movie that had a marketing blitz quite like this. You couldn't go to commercials on TV without an ad for the movie or an ad for something tying into the movie. I have some of those Taco Bell commercials burned into my brain with the little chihuahua saying, here, lizard, lizard. Yeah, you're right. And this is one of those movies that it's so inherently felt like it's meant to be a blockbuster that it doesn't understand it needs to be a movie also. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's a problem. In fact, like going back to the marketing, um, the first teaser trailer for this movie was shown in theaters a full year before the film was released. God. And the original teaser trailer, and you can look this up online was Godzilla's foot coming through the roof of a museum and crushing a T-Rex skeleton um and so the marketing blitz for this movie began so so early and like you said it was like unstoppable well i mean there was a there was a saturday morning cartoon and there was uh toys and i mean 
good lord, everything. I think there was a cereal. Like, oh, I'm sorry. I remember seeing it on opening night and getting like a commemorative ticket with a little sleeve and like a still uh, frame of the movie and stuff. Like, they really went all out for this thing. Oh, indeed. And what's amazing is that all of this marketing and everything, which I should also bring up that, like, in terms of the marketing Godzilla's design, they really, really intended to keep Godzilla's design a secret. So Godzilla actually never shows up in any of the marketing until opening day of the movie. Oh, oh man, that's right. All the commercials were just his foot. It's just his foot or his tail or things like that. So they show little bits and pieces, but they they kept it under under wraps. Enough so that I have read... That this movie, they didn't do any test screenings with audiences because <laughs> they were afraid of that it would leak the design, which is baffling, which is also probably why this movie is a mess, because you didn't have test audiences to say this works, this doesn't work. You know, uh, Matthew Broderick plays Matthew Broderick in it. Mm. And you're like, wow, which also I guess he signed on to the movie before he even read the script because the role was written for him. Um, and it's very obvious that it was. Yeah. Because he doesn't play, I know they call him the worm guy, but really he's just Matthew Broderick. So it's it's super irritating in those regards, but nonetheless. So you have all this marketing and and all of this stuff, and then this movie is technically a flop in theaters. Oh, uh, both critically and fiscally, deservedly so. Yeah, and you know, as you mentioned, you saw it in theaters. I totally saw it in theaters. We went with my family, since we are a Godzilla loving family, we totally went. I remember being like, you know, you know, at the time I was. I don't know, whatever, um, 13 or something like that. And I enjoyed it enough, but I remember being super disappointed in it, um, with it and everything like that. But it's funny to think about that. The movie was a disappointment considering how sure they thought they had a, a hit on their hands. Well, I mean, you can see it from an ignorant studio point of view because in their head, they're like, ID4 had shit getting destroyed. Godzilla has shit getting destroyed. People love the Godzilla movies. People love seeing shit get destroyed. This is a whiz bang home yep. run right here. Yeah. And I also want to point out in terms, you said it was critically panned, which it was. Uh, you, as you mentioned, there is the mayor character is named after Ebert and his, his aide is named Gene, right? As a, as a jab that Roland Emmerich, because Siskel and Ebert did not like uh, any of his movies prior to this, um, they ob- obviously gave this a negative review uh, and putting it as some of the worst films of the year uh, as one of the worst films of the year. I also just want to point out that I'm for these for these episodes for no franchise fatigue. I'm going to be adding in a new segment for every film that we talk about, which is the Rotten Tomato score, because I've become recently obsessed with Rotten Tomatoes and how strange that whole aggregate review score is in terms of movies. Godzilla 1998 is the lowest scoring Godzilla film of any Godzilla film ever made. Wow. It is a whopping 16% on Rotten Tomatoes. 16% is much too high. It also, I looked into it, was not Jean Reno's uh, first movie, but it did ironically come out the same year as Ronin. Oh, God, I love Ronin. Which I would argue is probably a slightly superior Jean Reno movie. <laughs> slightly, just slightly. Just a little bit. That much. Yeah. So, so this is a this is a, a widely disregarded by critics. I feel like for each of these movies, we also need to talk about the kaiju that's included. Now, this one only has essentially two kaiju. We have adult Godzilla and baby Godzilla. However, what are your thoughts? So, since both of them are stupid and really, really poorly designed, I think I'm instead going to use this time to throw the PS on that in Godzilla: Final War is a Japanese movie. Zilla is taken out by the real Godzilla in a simple tail swipe, and it is hysterical. So, okay, okay, before we talk about Godzilla and the baby Godzilla a little bit more, because I do want to talk a little bit briefly about that and, and why it doesn't work for me or does work for me. Um, 
the Godzilla Final Wars where Zilla does show up and Godzilla takes him out. Zilla shows up in Sydney, Australia. Now, the reason he shows up in Sydney, Australia and not the U.S. is that reportedly in the sequel script to this movie, which they were already developing before this movie came out, was that the baby Godzilla would end up in Sydney, Australia. That's stupid. <laughs> How? Why? I don't know. I haven't read it. I'm curious to see if that script is somewhere online because I would actually be really tempted to see what that has to do with anything. But reportedly, that's what it is. And because Toho has to, to read all of this, they had already had that script and, and they had looked at it. And so that's why they made that sequence in Godzilla Final Wars take play in Australia. So you did want to mention a little more about uh, the design from your angle. From my perspective, I don't mean to disregard your question entirely. Um, I never liked the boxy head, and that's the most notable design element to me for some reason. So I've never liked that. Um, I do think the eye is cool. I think the foot's cool. It actually is a cool image with the foot stomping down. Right. Um, but, you know, an eye and a foot does not a creature make. Unfor well, unless it's reanimator, but that's a whole different thing. But even think about that. Both of those are stolen from Jurassic Park. That's true. It's basically the T-Rex foot and it's the T-Rex basically, Yeah. So it's not even like that is wholly original. What's interesting about, I think, with Godzilla's design in this is that I'm not inherently against it. Like, if you're going to make an American Godzilla, I get it. You want to make it your own and things like that. So if you want to design it about, you know, with an iguana in mind, that's fine or whatever. What really irritates me about the Godzilla design more so is that it's obvious that Roland Emmerich wanted him to move fast. Yeah. But it's, like, weird. And it doesn't work. So you get these, like, interesting sequences where Godzilla's, like, running through the skyscrapers. And helicopters are chasing him. And then he just, like, goes through a building and disappears. And then he shows up below them, like Jason Voorhees. He, like, magically teleports places, you know, because he's so fast. And there's always this idea that if this monster is this big, there's no way it could move that fast. Like, the physics of it don't actually make sense. So they try really hard to make everything look realistic. And then completely blow it out of the water by having things like it, the way that it runs. Or things like that. And it just doesn't work for me. And then on top of that, you have a Godzilla who doesn't breathe fire. Yeah. And we're going to touch on this a little more in the 2014 version, actually. But, you know, there aren't a lot of things that you would say in a list of what makes Godzilla Godzilla. But if I were to make a list of just the immediately iconic things to me, two legs, the splines on the back, breathes fire. Yep. I mean, really. Yeah, and, and I guess Roland Emmerich was super against him breathing fire. And you'll notice in a couple of scenes in the movie itself that he breathes and then something ignites his breath. And that's where you get like a fireball. And I guess the reason they did that was because it, it was originally leaked out that Godzilla would not be having his thermonuclear breath and fans freaked out. And so they added it last minute that his breath would be flammable or something like that. So that, and so you'll see like the scene when he does that, where he blows down the alley and the cars are flying, like one of the cars sparks and that's what ignites the fire or whatever. And it's again, it's one of those things where it's, it's so stupid that it's almost incredible. It's just like, I don't understand. This movie does that over and over again. For example, do you remember how they introduced New York in this movie? Uh, not specifically. So it shows New York, and on the screen, instead of saying New York City, it says, the city that never sleeps. As literally words that, like, that are on the screen. That's well, how stupid this movie is. <laughs> that's rough. Incredibly stupid. So, all right, I'm done with this movie. Yep, I... Put it in the sin bin. Put it. <laughs> We're done with Godzilla. And I'm sure we'll reference Godzilla 98 as we go through these. Because if anything, there's if to recap Godzilla 98 is that they tried to Americanize Godzilla in all of the wrong ways. And I think that is incredibly key when we talk about the American Godzilla films, particularly as we move on to our next one, which is a reboot of the Godzilla franchise in America 
simply titled Godzilla 2014, uh, directed by Gareth Edwards. And the uh, first entry in the MCU, the, the Monster <laughs> Chronicle Universe. The Monster Chronicle Universe. <laughs> oh, the name Monarch. So, I, from what I gather, this is supposed they re- just simply refer to it as the MonsterVerse, which I is just terrible yeah yeah. um but it is what it is so here we have 2014 rolls around once again the american studios think that we need a godzilla movie now interestingly enough we are now in a as i mentioned before the twin towers and godzilla 98 we are in a post 9 11 world so we have an interesting take on godzilla that is both a throwback film to godzilla films prior and a very American take on this movie. And I think this is interesting. So to go through the basic synopsis of this is that originally you have Godzilla shows up due to the nuclear testing that happens uh, off of the islands in, in 1954, right? This idea. So this creates a group once they find out that this monster exists. This group is called Monarch. Now, as you mentioned, this is an important group for the rest of these American Godzilla films, because this will be the key concept that threads all of these together. Monarch scientists then start investigating this monster. You then fast forward to, it's not present day, in 1999. (laughs) We're fast forwarding to the past of 1999, which is hilarious because it's one year after the Godzilla 98 film. But, uh, you have the arrival of a new kaiju, uh, which is shown off screen. There's a nuclear power plant fallout. Uh, you are introduced to the Brian Cranston's father character and his wife at this point. He is there. He's a nuclear scientist at this when the nuclear plant falls out. Monster is still unknown at this point. He becomes obsessed with finding this monster. We then fast forward to current day where we are introduced to uh, Ford who is the son of Brian Cranston's character from the beginning, who is now uh, part of the U S Navy. Uh, he's actually, uh, I believe he's bomb disposal. Is that what he is? Yeah, that sounds right. I think he's bomb disposal, something to that effect. Um, he lives in San Francisco. We're introduced to this character. His father has been arrested in Japan. You find out he's kind of a crackpot scientist who's obsessed with investigating what happened at the nuclear power plant that he worked at. Uh, and why it's been walled off for radiation when he doesn't believe there's any radiation. We are then introduced as they get together, they go into the nuclear power plant to try to investigate. We find out there is no radiation, that everything has been a cover-up to cover up this monster that was devouring the radiation from the nuclear power plant. Now, the MUTO. The MUTO, which, what is it? It's, it's, it's like CHUD. It stands for Massive Whoa. massive Unknown Terrestrial Organism, right? Did Good. I, that right? I just had to look that up. That is exactly what it is. Yes. Okay. MUTO, which is stupid because later on in these movies, they refer to other, all of the kaiju as MUTOs. But, so this one is just, an, I guess, an unnamed a MUTO. So, but the MUTOs, that, that's what they're known in this movie. Uh, there are two of them. They are a bug-like creature. There's a male and female one. Uh, the uh, one that has been cocooned in this power plant is now calling out to its mate. The call out to its mate has awakened Godzilla. Here comes Godzilla trekking forward. We then have, weirdly, a chase film for a good portion of this movie as Godzilla is chasing the MUTOs as they're looking to uh, find a nest. So we're talking about nesting again. Also, uh, going to be honest, the chase film thing is going to be a theme of these Godzilla movies. I love it, too. I'm all for a good chase film. So, yes, we have Godzilla hunting these things down. You get this idea that Godzilla is an alpha predator, and these MUTOs are not alpha predators, but they maybe feed on Godzillas or are a something that can kill a Godzilla or other giant uh, alpha predators. And you have the humans chasing this down, trying to figure it out. These two giant monsters, the Mutos and Godzilla, battle across the United States. Uh, They end up uh, having a big battle in San Francisco, which is great. And uh, Godzilla, in the end, defeats the Mutos. As he does, Godzilla in this film is presented as somewhat of an anti-hero in his own way. Uh, which is a a unique take for the American Godzilla films. First time we see that. And uh, all is well in the world, and Godzilla goes and swims back, possibly to his bed. 
and that is Godzilla 2014. So first and foremost, um, design much improved. Yeah. Godzilla actually looks like a Godzilla in this. He spends an awful lot of it on four legs, which, eh, but he looks like a Godzilla. Right. Um, note two, really, really solid cast. Brian Cranston's good in this. Aaron Taylor Johnson is really, really good in this. And I actually really like Elizabeth Olsen or Ken Watanabe. I have assumed that's where I was going with this. Ken Watanabe is actually really, really good in this. Although, actually, Elizabeth Olsen's good in this, too. She's, She's decent. Yeah. Very, very good in many, many things. Um, you're right. This does feel like a Godzilla movie. It's not a disaster film. It's more of a tactical, like, how do we stop this thing before it takes more human life? I mean, it is a disaster in the strictest sense of, yeah, monster tearing down a town is always going to be a disaster, but that's not, like, the focus of this film. As a matter of fact, if anything, it's the money shot of this film. Or, um, sure. And I think my third note on this is going to be that uh, that parachute scene where they're parachuting into the smoke. Mm, uh, yes. This is... By and large, a very, very well shot movie. Gareth Edwards. Edwards. Um, Gareth Edwards. And like this entire movie is very well shot, has a very, very good eye. But I bring up that sequence specifically because it is just gorgeous. They showed it in all the trailers and it never spoiled it, even when it happens in the movie, even rewatching it for this uh, earlier today. Like that shot is just breathtaking when they're coming down with the flares and everything. Mm. Yeah. With the red and the storm going through the clouds. So good. Man, you touched on a lot of points I wanted to touch on with this movie. I don't even know where to start. When, when do we start with, if we started with the director for the first one, let's start with, with Gareth Edwards on this one too. Interestingly enough, I think he, not only does he like Godzilla and wants to make a Godzilla movie, but he knows how to shoot it like a blockbuster film, balancing the unrealistic elements with making it feel real. Not only does he get these cool shots with, like, like you said, the par- the the uh, parachuters that are coming in with the red flares. Uh, not only that, but you know uh, the sequences like with the mutos uh, through Las Vegas and mm-hmm. in the bright sunny desert. I think is a really kind of cool things that you don't necessarily get to see in giant monster movies as a desert scene, um, which I think is really interesting. Not only do you get to do that, well, these do tend to be coastal. It is a thing. Right, right. Well, they have to come from somewhere, so it ends up usually being the sea, right? So you like, right. you get you get a lot of coastal stuff. But he has such an eye for scope, which I think is really, really important for a Godzilla movie that Roland Emmerich does did not have with the last one. He shoots everything from either super low street angles to show you what the people see when they look at Godzilla, or he shoots from these really, really high long angles where you see how big Godzilla is compared to skyscrapers. So you get this idea of the scope and the weight of this creature. Unlike Godzilla 98, this mon Godzilla here isn't fast because he's massive, you know, and, and of course fans kind of made fun of him because he's a little on the chunky side in this, it's right? Godzilla. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm okay with, right? He was kind of chunky in some of the original Toho films, but you know, I like the, the mass. You feel the mass of Godzilla here, right? So even like when the Mutos, you know, you have one that's a land one, and then you have one that can fly. The design of these bugs, the one that can fly doesn't fly very fast. It doesn't fly around like a hummingbird or anything like that. Like when its wings flap, you, you feel like the force of it, the way he shoots it, you feel everything. And I think that's incredibly important in this movie just to show the sheer size of everything and even though this movie isn't a huge budget movie, he puts everything on screen. And I think that's incredibly important. And I really enjoy that. So allow me to touch on something a little more controversial. However, the movie's just glacially paced. Like, I don't dislike this movie, but I am admittedly a little indifferent to it because the good scenes are really good. But I just listed most of what I like about it. Uh, the final fight is really, really good. Um, kind of making his nuclear breath like a nuclear puke thing was actually kind of cool. Oh, I so I don't. Did you see this one in theaters? Oh, absolutely. Although, okay, so I was gonna say because I saw this IMAX 
opening night, Thursday night, seven o'clock. I had to see it, right? Because I'm a huge Godzilla fan. I will see every one of these movies opening night first showing I can, right? So see it this, right? Again, we talked about Roland Emmerich didn't have the thermonuclear breath. This movie does the fascinating thing where it, it withholds the nuclear breath. It withholds a lot. Like you said, it's it's paced to be more like the original Godzilla series, like Godzilla Raids Again and the original Godzilla, where you have all of the human elements pretty much in the front half, and then the back half is where all the the kaiju destruction happens. It's structured just like the original run. Which is um, so budgetary for both. Exactly, right? Um you know, and a lot of people complain that you don't get to see the Hawaii fight that, you know, Gareth Edwards cuts away from the Hawaii fight. I think part of that was to, I think part of it was an artistic choice, but I also think it was to save a little money. Like we were put, they were putting so much money into the final battle in San Francisco that they were trying to save money. Okay. I digress. I'm getting off topic here. You got, got me all going on this here, but I think, I think it's intentionally paced that way. I like what it does with its pacing with Godzilla it withholds a lot. It withholds showing Godzilla. It withholds showing the Mutos and almost until the second half of the movie. You only get to see glimpses of them. Um, and then his breath is the same way. So by the time his breath shows up, you get, which I also think is, God bless Gareth Edwards on this, but when Godzilla's spines start to light up, like he powers up the breath, Oh. And you see it start at the tail and you hear the noise. You hear it. It's like boom, 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 boom. It's like almost like an EMP powering up, right? And then when he kills the Muto with it and he literally opens the Muto's mouth like King Kong does in the original King Kong to break the T-Rex's jaw. He literally opens it up and then blows the fire and it melts out its throat. I was at a midnight showing of this movie <laughs> and the crowd stood up and cheered. So I would argue, yes, glacially paced. But I think it's paced for maximum payoff in the third act. And I think that that's why this movie really worked. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair so. enough. Oh, also, controversial opinion. I like the design of the Mutos. I actually think, and we'll touch on this a little bit more in King of Monsters uh, in a minute. But I actually like some of the unique kaiju they have here right um, you know i, I want to know more about the woolly mammoth guy i think the mutos are cool victims of a really stupid name but and yeah <laughs> um, i i also like i mean i'm also a big paul verhoeven fan love me some starship troopers i'll always take that kind of spiny insectoid sort of look i was well, kind of cool and i think what's kind of cool about them is that they almost look like robots mm -hmm. there's almost a and the fact that they have an, uh, an electric magnetic pulse kind of weapon. They saying they were the American Jet Jaguar. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Jet Jaguar. God, I love him. Um, I just found out, his, I found his theme song on YouTube the other day, and I was just playing it at work. <laughs> See if anybody knows I was playing the Jet Jaguar theme song. Um, Jaguar. Because Toho couldn't afford Ultraman. Yep. Yeah. They want to make his own. Which I, why didn't we get a Jet Jaguar series? That's a failure on their part. I don't know. Anyway, anyway, besides the point, I like that the Mutos are almost like robotic in feel. They're insectoid. Um, I get it that people are like, well, they're they're just black with red lines on them. So yeah, maybe this and and this is something that we'll see in the next two films that they they get much more colorful uh, in terms of films that this one's a little bit more realistic. But I think that it's Gareth Edwards' intention to make this film a little bit more realistic and a little bit more like a throwback to the original Godzilla. And, and I kind of like it. I like that it's kind of its own reboot and its own, you know, foundational film. And, you know, the fact that, you know, as we, as I said, I'm going to talk about Rotten Tomatoes with each of these films. But this film does have a 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. Critics tended to be pretty favorable of this movie, even though audiences tended to dislike that it took so long for Godzilla to show up on screen, that they, they felt like they were cheated out of a promise. We're going to see a giant monster movie uh, with, you know, explosions and destruction. And then that really only happens in the last 40 minutes. But I think it's... I kind of love this movie fair enough so and the cast is good i, I said i was going to mention the cast you're right absolutely stellar cast i don't love aaron taylor johnson in this i, don't. I think he's the weakest part 
And I certainly don't want to feel like I'm ripping on this movie. Well, yeah, but I mean, what other acting work do you have to compare with? Kick ass. Um, <laughs> Fair point. I, uh, you're forgetting Quicksilver. Am I? <laughs> But um, I I also don't want to sound like I'm being overly hard on this movie. This movie also has um, has the unfortunate distinction of coming out while my father was in the hospital for the last time. And um, so there's always a little bit of emotional distance with this movie and me. Um, That's not this movie's fault. And I fully admit that. But but like I said, I mean, the parts I like, I really, really like. Um, I like kind of. Ever since Scream, I'm always a fan of killing off your biggest name. And, you know, as I get older, I realize that's probably a little bit budgetary itself. But nonetheless, um, Cranston biting it early in Act One was like really shocking. Particularly because he was writing high on Breaking Bad at the time that this this was made. So I think everyone kind of, and I think that was part of the audience disappointment in this movie was everyone kind of expected him to be in the movie for the whole time. And he owns it in the scenes that he's in. He's incredible. They thought, gonna be, they thought it was going to be Raymond Burr. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And, and then he's not, and then he bites it, but he, and we'll get to this when we want to talk about themes a little bit. I'm going to dig into this. But I think there's an interesting theme in this movie about fatherhood mm-hmm. and parenting that becomes a theme throughout the series is parenting. This idea that the Mutos are trying to go mate. Um, you know, uh, Brian Cranston's character, even Aaron uh, Taylor Johnson as as the as a technically the lead of this movie, him and getting back to his family like he kind of abandoned his family to take care of a military thing. Yeah. And he keeps trying to get back to him and, and they keep waiting for him. So there's some interesting theming in this movie about parenting and, and particularly fatherhood that I think is just pretty subtle in there. That's just under there. Just, to, just in case you're looking for it, it's not something that, you know, it's necessary to understand the movie, but I think that that's kind of cool. I think it's a pretty smartly written movie. So yeah, no, definitely agree on that. And just uh, didn't want to touch on it too, too much. But uh, Gareth Edwards, also known for, or at least I was mostly familiar with him from uh, Monsters, which I think is a big part of why he got this movie, because that's a no-budget kaiju film. He did all of the special effects on his laptop. Oh shit! Is that true? Yeah, I had read that when because I when I first saw Monsters, I uh, fell in love with it. Full body shots of them in the movie—that's incredible. Yeah, I fell in love with that movie, and and you can tell that that was that was his like calling card for them to call him and be like, "We want to give you Godzilla because look at what you could do with nothing." And we know that we're going to have a you know for a a major film, we're going to have a little bit of a limited budget, so you know we would like to kind of check in with this and and go through that but um no i think you know and then obviously because of the godzilla was a surprise success in theaters um so that should be mentioned too but um you know it this movie was only 160 million dollar budget which is i mean it's big budget but you know comparatively speaking for how special effects heavy it is i'd almost argue that's a mid-budget anymore uh, that's true. That is a mid budget, but I mean, 160 million budget, uh, potentially did a 500, about 500, just under 530 million in the box office. Um, so surprise success for this movie. They didn't expect it to do this. Well, uh, it comes out, it kind of dominates the theaters. Godzilla kind of stomps on all of its competition for a hot minute, which is why they decided to move forward so quickly in creating, as you said, the MCU, of the monarch, what did you call it? monarch cinematic verse? Whatever. <laughs> I'm just gonna be. I I can remember Muto, but I can't remember what the hell you just said five minutes ago. <laughs> and I suppose it's a reasonably good time to continue with the with the monster verse. Let's just go with this right. <laughs> We're gonna call it the MCU the monster cinematic universe. We'll just yeah. But it's not the dark universe. I was to say, that's, that's what Universal was trying to make shit. That's what they were trying to make. Couldn't make it. And then they gave it to Blumhouse and they may get it made. So anyway. So. so next we have Kong Skull Island. This is going to be 
this is an interesting one to talk about in a franchise sense, and we're going to focus on the monster verse iteration of this because obviously Kong is one of the oldest creatures in cinema in a large way, arguably inspirational for Godzilla in the first place, kind of inspirational for the for concept sure. of monsters in the first place. Absolutely. Oh, so I think I can very, very simply say that I am a diehard die hard kong fan when i can look you dead in the eye and honestly say peter jackson's kong is my least favorite iteration and that's still a really pretty good movie that that says it all right there and yes that does mean i like the 70s version more and yes i'm still happy to fight you on this any day oh i have a feeling that this we might have to do king kong franchise just so we can talk about the two 70s films, King Kong and King Kong Lives, it's, because holy shit, I feel like we have differing opinions on that. But there this, is a there. Okay, I'll bring it up, because this movie actually has a couple of homages to the 70s King Kong, which I kind of like. It does, being <laughs> so, as it does in fact take place in the 70s. But we'll touch on that when we touch on that. Um, 70s is a good place to start, however, which is that um, in this movie, um, first time they've done a version of the story that's basically not about trying to make a movie <laughs> or environmental terrorism. The 70s one is weird. Anyway, um, <laughs> so Monarch, the organization from, and you know, obviously we're jumping into spoilers, so I'm just cutting through the bullshit here, but um, has an expedition set out for Skull Island where, you know, they're trying to research kaiju ostensibly um hey they but, don't know what's on there at least that's what they tell the military yeah mm, no idea <sighs> so um but they have a military escort and by the way if there is any one addition that this movie makes that no other version of kong has ever done really i think this is it Having it be a bunch of military guys in a uh, almost apocalypse now style like helicopter fight with Kong early on in this movie sets a tone that I don't think any other King Kong movies ever come close to. And I will give this movie that much. So regardless, that all happens and they realize now they have to survive on Skull Island with absolutely no extraction. And... Skull Island is very dangerous, but skipping kind of ahead to the main thread of the movie is they run into a pilot who crashed on the island in the 40s, who's able to give them a little bit of a heads up on the real nemesis of the island called... Skull Crawlers. Skull Crawlers. It's such a bad name. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to but, that. When we talk about the kaiju in full, we'll, we'll get to that. So, Yeah. But um, so suffice it to say, they befriend and enlist Kong to assist them in destroying the Skull Crawlers. And this also is the first King Kong movie to not bother removing him from Skull Island. The movie actually just ends with the surviving humans leaving, which I also think is a really cool move um, in this movie. And again, um, I know that's not the most in-depth synopsis, but of all the movies we're talking about here, this is actually the most straightforward of them. Um, first and foremost, it's an out-and-out creature feature. Like, there is shit on screen pretty much every frame of this movie. Um, just stuff on screen all over it. And that's a good place to start with Kong Skull Island, because... And I think this is important because not only is this part of the the monster verse that we're going to be talking about with Godzilla and all the various kaiju, but this is a movie that's also kind of a reaction to the criticisms of Godzilla 2014. That they people were like, there's not enough monsters, there's not enough action, things like that. And as you mentioned, Kong Skull Island, 15 minutes into this movie, is nonstop monsters in action. And... The fact that uh, the director... In my opinion, kind of to its benefit. Um, not the world's largest effects budget, but boy, Kong looks great in this I version. completely agree. I think that director Jordan Voigt, Ro Voigt Roberts... Is that known who for, Yeah, known for Boys of Summer, a weird indie coming-of-age movie of all damn things. Right. How he got this movie is beyond me. 
I am so glad he got it, though, because he embeds this movie with a lot of fun. And as you said, it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty straightforward adventure film. Um, Another good cast. Sam Jackson, John Goodman, Tom Hiddleston, Brie Larson, freaking John C. Riley, Like, stack cast, right? And he makes this weird balance between serious and complete cartoonish absurdity in this movie. Oh. Enough so... Sam Jackson is giving his best Colonel Kurtz, and it is glorious. It's weirdly good. <laughs> it's weirdly good. And he literally embeds this movie with so much colorful stuff. Like I said, Godzilla 2014, a little bit more realistic, a little bit more gray. Like both of the creatures are like Godzilla is a gray color. The Mutos are black, you know, very pretty, pretty urban, pretty modern in its color tones. This movie feels like a cartoon. I mean, bright colors all over the place, weird animals, you name it, just packed to the gills. I will also argue it's funny that it's the most action oriented because it's one of the few in this entire franchise that I would argue actually works as a creature horror movie because it emphasizes the one thing creature horror movies have as an advantage. All our modern technology is worthless against it. And I think that's really exemplified in a brilliant scene early on in this movie where this dude is making this big sacrificial moment. He knows he's going to die, so he's pulling out this bandolier of grenades and he's going to save all his compatriots. And this monster just tail smacks him into a mountain and he explodes uselessly. It sets it up for this glory hero moment, and it goes, no, that is not what this movie is. I I totally agree. This movie's funny. Don't get me wrong. John C. Riley both represents the heart and humor of this movie, which is a kind of an odd choice, but works, right? But this movie, now, I don't know how much we want to get depth, in depth on the themes of this film about Vietnam, simply because it, it's a pretty political topic, but it's very obvious that this film is meant to be a parallel to the Vietnam War and how we react. But in those themes, there's a lot of themes of, like, all of the plans that we lay out fail time and time again. Like, they come to this island to drop bombs to to do i'm going to put air quotes here for the listeners out there geography testing to see the geological stuff to it um whether or not that's true the, the movie keeps that vague right but they do that that's their plan guess what here comes kong fucking wipes out you know three quarters of their goddamn military escort right and then they're like every plan that they do we're gonna go save this guy well the guy's been dead for half the movie they have no idea Right. So everything that they plan out fails. And obviously that I think that's part of the Vietnam parallel that this movie's running. But that includes the scene where the guy has the bandolier of grenades. Here's this big hero moment and he fucking just gets slapped into a wall. Almost like a almost a Looney Tunes moment. Yeah. Where he gets slapped into a wall and explodes in the it, wall. It's like a wily e. coyote. It wasn't so casually cruel. It would almost be a Looney Tunes joke. You're 100% I, I, right. I kind of laugh at that moment every time it happens because it's just so wild. And you're like, okay. And that's what this weird... This So, going back to your initial statement, I would argue this is the second best King Kong movie. Yeah, it actually might be. And I think it's because of that weird balancing act that this movie does so well. It's a cartoon that has weirdly serious themes. All of the characters take it very seriously mm -hmm. and yet drop jokes every fifth line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. The skull crawlers thing is literally John C. Riley says, you know, that's actually the first time I ever said that out loud. It sounds pretty stupid. Yeah. And it sounds so stupid now when he it refers to the kaiju as skull crawlers. Um, which and it's funny because they look like they have skulls <laughs> like they're the way that their skin is looks makes them look like they have skulls. But um, I don't know. This movie is just a weird balancing act that I really, really appreciate. And it's a movie that even when I saw it in theaters the first time, I was like, oh, I, I like this. And then every time I watch it, I like it more and more because I get to pick out a lot of the weird details and a lot of the weird humor and and all of and all of the throwbacks to other King Kong movies. So. How do you feel about it as a remake? Because I already touched on this, but, you know, you don't have your Jack Driscoll. You don't have your, um, you know, it, you don't have New York. Like, a lot of... This is definitely a MonsterVerse movie. That's why we're talking about it in this franchise. I actually do agree with you, and I think it's a good assessment that it is probably the second or possibly third best King Kong movie. But, I mean, 
It's got like none of the classic stuff. Carl Denham doesn't have Andero, you know. All the other versions have some inkling of these characters, and this one is just like we've got King Kong and King Kong. But and as a matter of fact, he's not even King Kong, he's just Kong in this he's one. He's just Kong. Which I like. I prefer that he's just Kong in this. Okay, so... King Kong was uh, oh. Dar- Denim's uh, like marketing thing. Yeah, 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 Right, exactly. It was his marketing thing, right? The King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. So here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question. I'm going to be like, I-, I think it's a better remake than Peter Jackson's. Partially because it's not a remake. It's a reboot. So yes, we don't have any of the characters you mentioned, their names. But guess what? We have an adventurer. We have a photographer, right? She's a war photographer. She's not a filmmaker, but same concept, right? Mm -hmm. We have, you know, and this, this time they added military and things like that, but we have a lot of those same things. Sure. King Kong doesn't end up in New York, right? But guess who ends up in chains at the end of this movie? King Kong ends up in chains, right? And he uses the chains to fight back against the giant skull crawler, the mama skull crawler, right? That's a great scene. It's so good, right? And he pulls the chains and it's got the motorboat to it, like the yeah. fucking propeller from the, the giant ship. And he starts using it to beat, which just plays into the fun of this, of like King Kong who strips a tree and uses it as a baseball bat. Great stuff. Also, make no mistake, this movie was made and always designed with an eye towards Kong versus Godzilla. And in a way, the way Kong fights in this movie is setting up for that fight. They also make it expressly clear that this is not his full size. It is not a full-grown Kong. They right. um, make it expressly clear that it is intelligent, and in, he's tool-using intelligence. So it is going to be a brain-versus-nature battle, ostensibly. They're both huge monsters, but right. you know, Godzilla's nuclear-powered and Kong smarter. Right, exactly. And, and knowing that it's part of this grander universe, they, they introduce a lot of things. That obviously, even the teaser at the end of the credits teases Godzilla King of the Monsters because Godzilla King of the Monsters is essentially already in pre-production. Kong Skull uh-huh. Island. So you have all of this stuff. I also want to point out, in, in going back to this being a remake, that this is a film that it's obvious that you know the director and the writers and stuff have a love of the original films because you get a little bit of every king kong including the 1970s one he fights a goddamn octopus in this randomly and you're like why is this scene here well that's because he fought a goddamn octopus in king kong versus godzilla in 1963 there's a whole scene where he fights an octopus in that and it's great right and so you're like oh that's why this is here so there's like throwbacks to all this and as you said like you know the original one you still have like the the tribe that lives there that worships Kong, that's still a, uh, a prevalent story plot point. So it's Although less this of... Time they're not like a savage tribe rapidly running to sacrifice the pretty blonde lady. It, right, it treats it much better than that, right? They, they've they taken in this this uh, this white gentleman who crash-landed on their island, you know, and have taken him in and, and made him one of their own. So mm-hmm. this movie kind of picks and chooses elements of all the other Kong movies, and, and does kind of a remix with them. And I think that that's what makes it so much fun to watch again and again, is every time I watch it, I'm picking up something new. I mean, the skull crawlers are in the original King Kong movie. It's the thing that's climbing up the vine. When it's the guy, when the guy falls off the log and he's climbing up the vine, that's what the skull crawlers there. And then even in the original King Kong, you know, there was an, an edited scene from the original one where they, the people who fell to the bottom of the pit had to fight off giant bugs. Mm-hmm. And that was a scene that was cut from this, which is a, an element in this movie is there's so many giant bugs, um, which is great because everything's giant here. Right. Um, on this island, that island that God forgot to forgot to stop creation. I don't know. Um, John Goodman has a great line where he says something to that effect um, in this movie. But I, I guess this also leads into we have to talk about all the different kaiju here. You mentioned Kong is a great design. I want to go into that for a hot second, but beyond kong what's your favorite what's your favorite kaiju in this film you know actually it it really is uh the the mama skull crawler it's a bad name but boy it is a good design that is a creepy spindly uh you you mentioned that this series has been very very good about large creatures being slow and it gives them this kind of mass and power 
but when they break that rule a little for this thing and makes it kind of fast and spindly, it's cool in this case because it's the exception, not the rule. You know, you can have a fast giant monster, but it can't be like every giant monster is running around, you know? Right. Well, and the skull crawlers are originally much smaller to begin with. So you get this idea that that they're a little bit faster or things like that. No, that's a, I mean, that's, the skull crawlers are a cool design. Like I said, it's from the original King Kong, the two-legged lizard but that climbs up the side. At the same time, um, let me just like out and out give it up for that King Kong design. I'm sure you've got stuff to say, but for me, um, I like that it broke in the other direction from the Peter Jackson movie and didn't bother making a realistic giant gorilla. It's just a gorilla-like giant monster. Um, it's almost more akin to human than a gorilla, really, outside of the face. And I really like that. Other thing I like is you can tell that he's been surviving since he was very, very young, and that story is told in the scars up and down his body. And I think that is just, that's just good design. Fully agree. Now, that's the, exactly what I wanted to mention about Kong's design that I alluded to earlier, is that I think Kong's design in this is really good because he is less gorilla-like. Now, the reason I like this is because if we are talking about a Godzilla shared universe, right, and we're leading up to a Godzilla versus Kong movie, then we need to be able to look. Yeah. Well, and we need to be able to look back at King Kong versus Godzilla. Um, (laughs) The gargantuan is about Frankenstein, not. Yes, it's a giant Frankenstein monster. Yes, we. Oh, oh, yeah. When we do our stupid films that should have been franchised, we're going to be talking about (laughs) War of the Gargantuas. Um. No, but Kong, if we're going to be talking about the shared universe with King Kong belonging in the Godzilla universe, right, leading up to this new movie, we need to look back at King Kong versus Godzilla. Well, in those movies, King Kong is a man in a suit. Mm -hmm. He walks like a man in a suit. And the design of this, he walks like a man in a suit. And it's kind of kind of awesome. You're like, (laughs) like, it's CGI, right? His design is good, but he. You know, he's he's not walking on his knuckles. He's bipedal, right? And things like I fucking love that he's like that. He that like you said, he's a monster that's gorilla like, not necessarily a giant gorilla. Um, but what about you? Did you any other kaiju that particularly stuck out to you? The the octopus monster was kind of cool, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the octopus monster. But I'm gonna have to go with the giant spider mm. sequence, particularly because number one, it impale the leg impales one of the soldiers and it's an homage to cannibal Holocaust, which is like, we're going to make a PG 13 family friendly adventure monster movie. And we're going to put a cannibal Holocaust homage in here. Like, what the like hell? That, that thing's legs literally looked like thin tree trunks too. So they didn't even realize they were no. And it, and the spiders got like little like pinchers yeah. at the bottom of it. Oh, like, like, it came down and like reeled guys up and stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that's a terrifying design for sure. Terrifying. And as you said, this, this one kind of leans a little bit into the creature feature horror element. I'm sorry. That spider sequence is horrifying. This it's... idea that it's above you and it's like, it's like, has like these tendrils that oh. come down, like these like gooey things that grab people. And then the way that they beat it is they're like, we, you know, we can't, we're trying to shoot straight up in the air. So they're like, cut down the legs. And so they start slicing the legs. But then when you think about that, you're like, that's a terrible idea. Cause that means the top part's going to come down, <laughs> you know, like that's where all the teeth are, <laughs> you know, like, but it's, um, which you kind of touch on it. And I, I mentioned it briefly, but it's also very, very much a uh, Vietnam throwback, but it's also, also, very very much kind of our traditional manly man green beret style heroes you know right um that are just getting massacred by this stuff they can't really compensate for like they don't really know how to deal with something where they flew a helicopter into it and it didn't kill it (laughs) yeah well and i'd love that the the kills in this movie are weirdly inventive and like very graphic for a pg-13 movie holy crap for sure. Literally the scene where the guy is like hiding behind in the, in the helicopter attack scene, there's a scene where the guy's hiding behind this thing and he's, he's like waiting there and then Kong scoops him up 
and throws him at the other helicopter and he hits the windshield of the helicopter and then rolls up and hits the propeller blade and takes the helicopter down. <laughs> and you, it doesn't show it, but you hear it. It's like, bang, you see the body hit the windshield and then the camera pans up because you see him roll. And then you hear the propeller go. And you're like, oh my God, the body hit the propeller of the helicopter and took it down. You're like, that is so violent. And you're like, but it's such a weirdly inventive kill. Like you said, it's almost like a slasher movie at times. <laughs> um, it's just nature killing people. But uh, yeah, no, I, I do think this is a good movie. We haven't mentioned John Goodman much or the connection to the whole monarch thing, but um, I think that's actually handled reasonably well. It's subtle. It's not the focus of the movie. Um, it's kind of going on the, uh, under behind the scenes. Uh, and... I actually think the little credit stinger at the end of this is kind of fun where they're just looking at the hieroglyphics of the other kaiju and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, I think Monarch is handled well here. I like that it's like they have to go to a congressman because they're running out of money. They're going to be broke because they were developed, you know, in the 40s to talk about Godzilla and do that search and everything. And and they're all considered crackpots. You know, they bring up the hollow earth theory is in this, which becomes a major plot point in the next film. And so, like, I think it's interesting how they handle it, because it is really like a subtle way of doing the world building without necessarily, you know, hammering it in that this is world building. So, yeah, Um, which I do think brings us nicely into. So that brings us to Godzilla. King of the Monsters, 2019. Now, I have to differentiate that this is 2019. That was a King of the Monsters, yeah. Because the original Godzilla was retitled Godzilla, King of the Monsters, in 1956. So, we need to differentiate that this is 2019. So, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to refer to this as Godzilla 2. So, that just to save us a little bit of time and effort here. But, so... Kong Skull Island leads us into Rodan's Revenge. Rodan's Revenge. Godzilla King of the Monsters takes place, uh, obviously, after the events of Godzilla 2014. It opens up with the Battle of San Francisco in the aftermath, showing all the destruction that happened because of Godzilla and the Mutos. Um, We are introduced to a a family, a, a family that's been torn apart by the death of their son, In the Battle of San Francisco, we're introduced to a dad who is now a wildlife photographer and then a mom and daughter, uh, the mom played by Vera Farmiga, who I love. And then the daughter played by Millie Bobby Brown uh, of Stranger Things fame. The mom and daughter work for a monarch. They are developing a system that is an alpha call to be able to handle all the various monsters the kaiju that they have discovered throughout time as monarch has been around because we are done with this one at a time crap yep yep we are done yeah we are we got to speed this shit up so um so they are working on this call system we discover uh in the opening sequence they are working on it and it works on mothra when mothra hatches as a larva um that the call center the call it's a briefcase, really. Really, it's a MacGuffin. Um, but it's uh, here it works on Mothra to calm Mothra down. It's able to communicate with her. And then uh, terrorists show up. They steal the briefcase and they decide to go. They are going to cleanse the world by unleashing all of the kaiju uh, that they can using the system to control them. Their first stop is Monster Zero, which is King Ghidorah in Antarctica. King Ghidorah is then unleashed, and we have discovered that King Ghidorah is not just an alpha predator, but a super alpha predator. And an alien. And an alien. Oh, my God, I love it that it's an alien. Thank you, throwback. Um, We're introduced to King Ghidorah at this point. King Ghidorah then has starts to awaken all the other kaiju himself. Instead of using the machine, they are going to get their wish. King Ghidorah is going to wipe out all of existence on Earth because King Ghidorah is a bastard. He goes and wakes up Rodan. We then have our human team, which includes the dad of the family, uh, trying to chase down the terrorists who have taken mom and daughter hostage to be able to awaken all the kaiju. They go all over the world in a matter of minutes. They fly around super fast, 
uh, across the world to unleash all these kaiju. We are then uh, introduced to Full Mothra, who hatches as a full, full moth form. Um, Mothra and Godzilla then join teams to uh, fight off Ghidorah and Rodan in a battle in Boston. Now, I could go further into the human element of this plot, but I feel like we're probably going to talk a little bit about that. So I think maybe I'll just save that for beyond the synopsis. So hit me. Godzilla 2. How do you feel about this one initially? I love this movie. Everything about it. Uh, I think the ratio of monster battles to humans is damn near perfect in this. I think it's just enough silly BS sci-fi speak to really kind of tickle that nostalgia in the back of my head. Because, I mean, they're just making words up in this one. Oh, this is the this is the alpha call, and the real secret was the human voice. Like, it's it's just silly. It is a... It's s- full G-science. Full s- G-science. Oh, 100% G-science. But at the same time, like it creates stakes in this really, really interesting way because this is um, this time we've got Michael Doherty as a director, and this guy is an out-and-out horror... Well, actually, he's a horror comedy master, frankly, but, like... He only directed two movies prior to this, both of them being horror movies. And both of them are great horror movies, and I'm a full-on Krampus defender. Same. So, whoop, whoop. But, um... <laughs> whoop, whoop for Krampus. So there's a few things in this movie that are, like, actually pretty horrific in its own right um you brush by kind of seeing the san francisco scene from another angle but like you don't get to see that ground level of a godzilla attack very often in movies um especially proper godzilla movies there have been a few knockoffs that have touched on it but um that seems really disturbing actually because it, it just really emphasizes the powerlessness of being a person on the ground during an attack like that on the other hand of that like um the rodan scene you know i've been wanting to talk about this forever that's just horrifying this thing is a giant bird who flaps his wings so hard that just the sonic boom of him flying is hyper destructive i think you're you're spot on with this that michael doherty brings a sense of both fun and consequence to this. Now, Gareth Edwards kind of started this. As I mentioned, his style was shooting from the street level. You get to see all of that. You know, Kong Skull Island takes it a bit further, shows a lot of the, like, these monsters killing people in horrifying ways that we just discussed. And then this one kind of combines it. Yeah, the hurricane winds from Rodan's, the wing flap, you know. Not only do you get to see, like, in the original series, you would see Rodan would do it, and you would see buildings fall apart or whatever. And this one, you get to see people that are, like, clinging onto pillars and things like that because they're being blown so hard, you know? And so you see the destructive power of all of this. And so, but it also feeds into the story, this idea that these monsters are, you know, the terrorists believe that these monsters are here to cleanse the earth, right? And so you get a little bit about that. And I I like that there's a sense of consequence to this movie, Mm -hmm. even if, you know, this idea of four giant monsters doing a fucking battle royale in the middle of Boston ends up being like the ultimate consequence of this movie, which is, you know, Boston, right? What? Uh, you mention it, and it didn't even occur to me till literally the second. So I'm verbalizing this for the first time, but like, very honestly, even the idea of terrorists in this universe using kaiju is such a stroke of genius because you could not possibly name a more massive weapon of mass destruction. Absolutely. I mean, Godzilla is a walking thermonuclear bomb and they actually bring that up in this. And, and that actually, I guess the terrorist thing leads me to the, to the main point I want to make about this movie is, is I, I also love this movie. Don't get me wrong. This movie is fantastic and everything. This is a movie that as a Godzilla fan has so much throwback to other films. It is essentially a Godzilla's greatest hits. Mm Mm-hmm including the terrorist plot, because there are terrorists in Godzilla 1985 who plan to use Godzilla's DNA to create new weapons of mass destruction in the, in the 80s and, and early 90s Godzilla films, which is an interesting idea. And so it's funny that Michael Doherty must be the biggest Godzilla fan of all time, because this movie is completely and utterly littered with Easter eggs 
and bits and pieces it's a puzzle built of various other godzilla elements from previous films of like the toho series all put together and as a fan see a smog monster but by god no i'm kidding no you're damn right it's coming hedora is coming (laughs) um hedora is coming for your cats so Uh, but do we get the weird trippy acid music sequences Ooh, that's that might be left in the 70s i'm I'm just being honest (laughs) i that's uh, let's be honest godzilla versus hedora is a movie that only gets better with time every time i watch (laughs) it it gets better you would think it would get worse when the when the gimmick wears over of it being such a 70s environmentalist film but it doesn't it just gets better (laughs) with time um it's such a weird fucking movie it is but so this movie really is godzilla's greatest hit so First things first, why don't we talk about the people plot? Let's because this movie's almost two plots going on. Yeah. And as you and as I mentioned before, the original Godzilla movies or original Godzilla, Godzilla 2014 is a chase film. So is this one, right? Yeah. So why don't we talk about the human element first with the family and all of the monarch people that we're talking about? All Does right. this work for you? So I'm gonna touch on these point by point. The terrorist plot, Charles Dance, Vera Farminga, fucking Charles um, Dance, Bobby man. Brown. Man, that all brings it, and I am a hundred percent here for it. Um, I'm, I'm really a big fan of all of that stuff. Kyle Chandler in the magic submarine with the rest of the B movie rejects, uh, chasing around Godzilla and begging his help. Like, that works for me a little less. It's enough to get the movie from point A to point B, and I'm not going to complain, but it's not especially compelling either, to me. No, and I would argue that in terms of writing, this might be the weakest script of the MonsterVerse. Definitely. The Alpha Call is such a flagrant MacGuffin, and it's one of those things where even watching the movie, you can look at it and be like, this is never going to come up again. This is literally monumentally scientifically world changing. And this is never going to come up in any of these movies ever again, because it's inconvenient. Right. This Which really is... only works in terms of this one plot. Right. And you're like, Oh, it can call monsters and tell them what to do. So it's a monster mind control device, which is such a Godzilla fucking trope at this point. Like yeah. by the time, you know, cause essentially this is a loose remake of, of, uh, um, of Astro Monster, which is the Min- first Ghidorah film. Minus the, the humanoid alien agents, more or less, yeah. Right, but even them were trying to do mind control. Yeah, that's and true. Later on in, in, in the later sequels, they're trying to do mind control on the monsters, which is like even the plot of major ones. is like, all, all of the kaiju have, have been mind controlled by aliens, right? And so you have here is you have King Ghidorah, who is a monster who has the ability to uh, call other kaiju to his side as an alpha in a mind control kind of style pattern. So yeah, you have this human plot and you're like, you said, there's almost two human plots. You have the terrorist, the mom and daughter plot, and then the monarch plot. Right. I, I think that this movie dedicates a lot of time to that and could have been even tightened up more because, and part of it is this movie's like over two hours. I think it's a little bloated and it feels rushed at two hours. Right. You're like, because they're, and part of it is we're introducing three completely new kaiju into this universe that a more casual fan has never seen before. But we're also at essentially adding in an entire new set of human characters and a lot of them. Essentially, the only char- there's a couple of characters that return from Godzilla 2014, but Ken Watanabe comes back uh, in this, um, who actually has the best scene in the movie which is the scene where he goes to revive Godzilla after Godzilla loses his first battle with King Ghidorah, which is such a weirdly heartfelt scene. Um, and like when he like pets Godzilla and puts his hand on him. So good. And then so, nukes himself. Um, <laughs> I do appreciate that. Like yeah, he had to jumpstart Godzilla <laughs> like a car. Um, <laughs> God, that's so true. That, <laughs> But, you know, he's yeah, running low on his battery, so we got to jumpstart him. we got to plug him back in. But, um, yeah, you do have two. And for me, it gets muddy because you do get, like you said, a lot of the, the human plot gets relatively. There's so much exposition going on in the human plot that they have to simplify a lot of the characters to caricatures. And. Well, on top of that, they they make a bunch of. We, we deal straight with spoilers here. Vera Firminga 
Scott's character, um, her betrayal, that only has emotional impact when you assume we give a shit about anybody in the movie. And I like Kyle Chandler, and I like Vera Farminga. I even like Millie Bobby Brown as much as you can like the child actor, but, like, like he said, it's kind of the weakest script because I don't care about any of these people. Right. Yeah, and, you know you get the idea of the loss and the split of the family is, is interesting enough, you know? And like I said, it's actually a lot of these characters are character elements pulled from previous Godzilla films, which makes it interesting, but not enticing, which I think is a a kind of a key factor here. So, and it spends a lot of time with the people and, you know, obviously Kyle Chandler's character is meant to be the audience surrogate because he's being introduced to all of this stuff even though he originally worked with Monarch. So then he has to be retold everything. So he um, kind of acts as the audience surrogate at this point. And, you know, we're supposed to follow him. But like you said, he, he you know, this whole movie is just explaining everything. So that interesting characters, like how they modernized the twins, the fairy twins. Although as, they point that out. So you'd only know that if you read that on a web article. <laughs> Well, what's funny is like, as soon as like she showed up, I'm like, oh my God, she's one of the twins because she's like, I take care of Mothra. And you're like, oh, like the fairy twins. Cause, cause, and we'll get there with the kaiju, but I'm obsessed with Mothra. Mothra is like one of my favorite kaiju of all time. So like, I was like, okay. And then they, but the movie doesn't like make a point of it being like, these guys are twins. It's pretty subtle in a lot of ways. So, and it's, I wish there was time that if we cut more of the characters out, we would have had more time with other characters to be able to really like flesh them out and things. And part of it is, I think, as you said, even with Kong Skull Island, there was this idea that we were already three films ahead of where we were. So they're thinking about, you know, Godzilla ver- or Kong versus Godzilla, or Kong- Godzilla versus Kong, sorry, Godzilla first, Godzilla versus Kong. And so I think this movie almost feels like part one of a two-parter yeah and it's and sometimes that that oh, yeah for sure that rubs me a little bit the wrong way um don't get me wrong i i adore this film like i said i've seen this already like a half dozen times and even though i think it's the weakest script my guess is this will be the one i watch the most of the new oh. ones because for all the complaining we can do about the human plot, let's talk about the monster fights in this movie. Because holy crap, for one, they're plentiful. Yeah, I almost want to break down each one. Because each one is super fucking cool, right? And and part of it is is that we, we're introducing three new kaiju, right? We're introducing Rodan, the firebird from hell. We are introducing Mothra, you know, queen of the monsters. Or, you know, a surrogate for Mother Nature in a lot of ways. Um, And then we're introducing King Ghidorah, the big bad of this film. Um, The big bad of most of the Godzilla franchise uh, in general. So we're introducing three new ones on top of Godzilla. And, you know, Michael Doherty, smart enough, he knows he has to give each one their kind of their own scene. And I think that that's really smart. And here's my thing on this latest watch. This is so stupid that this is the first time I've noticed this. On my most recent watch, I realized that each one has its own color scheme. Uh, I actually did pick that up. Um, I, I feel like that's so obvious, and I didn't. Because all of Ghidorah stuff's like yellow. Um, yep, and, and then Mothra's and is blue, red. and Rodan's is like a yellow red. Yeah, I'm like, son of a bitch. Like, that, I'm like, how obvious is that? And then it just dawned on me. But he does, he has to give each one kind of their own scene, which is kind of nice. Outside of which is kind of my my other complaint about this film, is that Mothra doesn't really get her own scene in this movie. Agree to disagree. I think Mothra has one of the greatest reversals in giant monster fight history in this movie. I also agree when we get to the final battle royale, but I wish she had her own fight scene. That's true. She she really doesn't. She does have... But um, I think it's almost a better way to combine talking about the fight scenes with talking about the kaiju, because... This is the first one where we finally got multiple known named kaiju, where we actually have a history with some of these characters. Right. So, like, for me, um, you know, obviously this entire talk is about our history with Godzilla, so that's that's a given. We know Zilla. This is, this is our boy from the 2014 version. Um, a little cranked up, a little older, a little wiser, a little more powerful. Classic spines. They f- mm-hmm. they changed his spines in this one to make it look more like the old school Godzilla, which, tip of the hat to you, Michael Doherty. 
Also, boy, if that uh, plasma puke looked cool at the end of 2014, his lasers are really cool in this one. Yeah, he he kicks a lot of ass in this one. And then we'll get to the we'll get to the battle royale with a burning Godzilla here in a minute, <laughs> which is kind of like the new Godzilla element. So um, then you've got Mothra, who is probably the closest to her original design, save one caveat, which is giving her a stinger. I didn't realize how cool that would be. But as it turns out, giving Mothra an offensive weapon was metal. Uh, it's so good. Yeah, because Mothra, for the most part, in the, in the original series, is presented as a as a creature of peace that only kind of comes out when devastation happens, right? So we have a Mothra's original film, Mothra, which is more about like her coming back to defend nature against human expansion and things like that, and then her introduction into the Godzilla franchise is in a movie called Mothra versus Godzilla where Godzilla was almost an inconsequential villain. It, if you if you swapped out Godzilla with any other monster, it would still worked. It didn't have to be Godzilla. Um, because the movie works as Mothra Part 2, that just happens to feature Godzilla. So even though it's the fourth Godzilla film. So, so Mothra's got an interesting history of being more of a peaceful creature, which is why I think initially Michael Doherty didn't give her her own single fight scene. Well, it's kind of hard, too, because most of her abilities are like poison dust, shield, and healing Godzilla. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. But it's interesting because, especially in later films, you know, you get this idea, because Godzilla, for the most of the Toho run, is a villain. So that should be noted here in that Mothra is usually fighting Godzilla because Godzilla is the villain and Mothra is trying to save the earth or whatever that might be. But when Godzilla and Mothra have to team up, particularly in the 60s round of more sci-fi oriented Godzilla films, uh, they work literally as a tandem. And there's this idea that there's like a symbiotic relationship, which they really bring forward in this one, which I really like, too. So, um, briefly touching on Rodan, I already talked about his wings flapping. Boy, the design is so cool. He's evil! It's it's so easy to hear Firebird and think Phoenix, and this thing is like, like, hell Firebird. Yeah, it just looks wicked. Coming out of that volcano, like, is so creepy. And yeah, it's the- not so well. It's such a good effect. And the big, how big his talons are. And he has like almost a vulture like look. His mm-hmm. head looks more like a vulture. It's just glow. Yeah, it, it's good stuff. And I will admit with the Rodan stuff, well, well, we can argue about Rodan all the time because I do not love Rodan. Mm. Don't. He's one of my least favorite kaiju from the original Godzilla run. He's a bro. He's a bro kaiju. Um, I don't, I don't even remember what I told you. What did I tell you? That he was like the kind of guy that rides around on an ATD and, pit and doesn't start fights, but just joins fights or picks fights to get other people hurt. Um, that's Rodan. So, come on. His fight with Ghidorah in, in the second act of this movie is legit. When you see them kind of on a crash course each other, because, you know, Rodan has the great sequence where he's fighting off the fighter jets. Mm-hmm. And come on, Rodan doing a barrel roll. Is trying like, to catch up with him as he's peeling away when he actually cranks it into overdrive too. Yeah. Oh, such a good shot. That's so and, good. Yeah, like you say, the barrel where he pulls his wings in tight and just spins like a bullet. Yeah. And he wipes out like three planes doing it. It's just great. And there's like ash coming out from behind him. The designer Rodan here is just aces. So you're right. Rodan is. I actually think this might be my favorite version of Rodan. And then um, obviously got to talk about the big bad here, which is Ghidorah. Um, I, I cannot mention enough how cool it is. I think that the threat of this movie is that Ghidorah is such a powerful alien creature, monster, that his very presence terraforms the planet he's on. Him existing is a threat to human life. I think that's really cool. Right, that he's always enshrouded by an electrical storm, which is such a cool idea. I mean, it makes for that, like, the final battle gets a little bit hazy because there's so many clouds in the background. It's almost like too good of an idea for it to work as visually well as it could have to Mm -hmm. use him. But I also like that in this movie, you know, the original Ghidorah in the movies is interesting because normally you have a guy in a suit, right? So you have an 
a head, two arms, two legs. And then you have Ghidorah, who has no arms, giant wings, two tails, three heads, and the heads just fucking wave frantically. And you're, it's like this, like, frantic energy monster, which, you know, he does have energy beams, which look like lightning. But um, in also, this movie... I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. No, I was going to say, and in this movie, you get that same feeling, but I like that all the heads have different personalities. I'm literally going to say the same thing. Okay. I feeling. That's why I didn't step on your toes there, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's cool that it's, and then th- the the sound design for each of the monsters is really cool too, because Ghidorah has a lot of these like rattlesnake noises. You'll see his tail shake like it's a rattlesnake, like the clubs with the spikes on the end of them will shake. And I'm like, that is such a cool detail that they added in that they didn't have to. And they did. And I think that that really works for me too. And the original design of King Ghidorah has always been, you you could just always tell it was made to kind of sell toys because he's very bottom heavy. Like it's meant to just stand very well. Yep. Um, But boy, they make it work in this. It almost looks like a creature that could exist. Almost. Right. Well, and you get like even the scene and, and we'll get to the Battle of Boston here in a second, but where Godzilla and Godzilla finally starts to move a little bit faster in this one, you get this idea that he has to crank up his weight to get running, whatever, which is kind of an interesting way. But I like that when King Ghidorah moves, he moves like a snake. He almost like slithers like his head, his heads. And I'm doing all these hand motions so that none of our listeners can fucking see, which is great. Another great detail of it is he's not much of a walker. He does have those big, ridiculous legs, but, like, it's definitely a flying creature. Right. And that's why when you get, like, the Rodan battle with him, they're flying at each other, and you get the scene where, like, Rodan sees him and goes to pull its wings back and throws out its back feet. And you get, like, the the silhouettes of them in the storm as they're lo- going towards each other is so good. And you're like, visually, it's just a stunner. Um, yeah, and I do think Michael Doherty brings, uh, we mentioned it a little bit, but he brings a lot to it uh, visually. Um, we don't have, like, another skydiving scene per se, but, you know, even though I don't care about any of the human characters, shots of them running through Boston while this fight's happening, you know, like at Wrigley stadium and stuff is really cool. And it gives you this sense of scale. And again, like I mentioned early kind of powerlessness, it's almost, yeah, find a way to bring it up every episode. Lovecraftian. (laughs) No, in particularly with Ghidorah being from outer space, there's certainly a Lovecraftian element that that's there for that. And I I do like that. And I think that going to that, Michael Doherty does have a knack for visuals in this movie, particularly because like we mentioned, like Rodan coming out of the volcano is a great entrance. Each of these monsters has a great entrance. Oh um, yeah. Mothra coming out of her cocoon for the first time and just like unfolding those wings in that pure bath of white light is so cool. It's like this ethereal, and then the original Mothra theme pops up at that moment from the original movies. And mm-hmm. like, honest to God, when I saw this, I saw it in IMAX opening night, like I do with every Godzilla movie. Literally, like the hair, like my hairs are standing on my arms right now because I love Mothra so much. And the Mothra theme popping up just like kills me. My heart grows three sizes. The Grinch is like jealous and everything when that happens. It's great. I just adore it when that happens. That exact note, um, them popping in the original Godzilla theme was really cool too. Absolutely. Right. Scene. Burns, da, 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 da. Oh, so good, right? And Bear, McCre- Bear McCready's score to this movie is in stellar to begin with. Um, wasn't such a huge fan of his rendition of Blue Oyster Colt's Go Go Godzilla, uh, that he held he did with Serge Tankin. Um, r- r- strange song. Um, but I love the score to this movie, I think it's very bombastic and good. Um, and using all the original classic scores for each of the characters just kind of works for me. But even Ghidorah's uh, arrival from Antarctica, where you see the the ice collapse and then you see the lightning come out, almost feels like the scene in like Big Trouble in Little China with the three storms, you know, the hole in the street. And then you see the lightning popping out of it. So good. And, you know, and King Ghidorah's like big snaking heads and everything coming out of it and the big wings and stuff like that. He just looks like a demon from hell and it, it works. And if we're just talking like winning single shots, 
um, the end of the big fight at the end of the movie where um, King Ghidorah's head whips up one more time and it's like, oh shit, he's still alive. And then you realize it's actually just Godzilla slurping it up. <laughs> yeah, and then he shoots the beam through it. So good. Oh, yeah. Such a winning shot. Well, and I think maybe maybe now's the time to talk about the Battle of Boston because the Battle of Boston has a lot of interesting things going for it. As you mentioned, it's got a lot of ground level stuff. We have the family driving in the Jeep as Ghidorah's chasing them, which is like, I mean, because Ghidorah's much bigger than Godzilla and Godzilla's already like the second largest Godzilla ever in the history of the films and everything like that. So that's, or this one might be the biggest one. I was about to say, because what's what's it going to compare to? Shin? Shin's... Shin Godzilla. So, if memory serves right, Godzilla 2014 was the biggest one, and then Shin Godzilla was bigger. And then they made him bigger here, because he's he's grown or whatever. His doors, because okay. he's recharged. They make a note in this movie about it, that he's changed since the last battle. Which is why his dorsal fins are different and everything like that. And that, supposedly, I think he's like one meter taller than Shin Godzilla. Mm. Or something that that effect. I don't know. Whatever. Toho's just happy to be selling shit. So, um, but King Ghidorah is this huge, and so you have the battle of the Boston where King Ghidorah comes out and he starts calling all the kaiju to him, and and here comes Rodan, and Rodan's like, "Hell, I'm on your side," and you basically get a two on two fucking ring match in the middle of Boston. And let's be honest, Mothra beats Rodan. Although, in my boy's defense. He does body Mothra for a long time before she pulls out that sneaky uh, tail stinger. Yeah, and Mothra does have the web sling thing where she like webs Ghidorah's heads to the building or whatever. That was uh, cool. And then Godzilla tackles him through the building. It's so good. Uh, but you do get this kind of like two-on-two match here where they all get up. And then, of course, I have to mention it, but bringing back Burning Godzilla... Godzilla is defeated and Mothra sacrifices herself to give him the energy needed where he almost essentially like like a nuclear reactor starts to boil over and he becomes this burning Godzilla, which is an obviously in reference to Godzilla versus Destroya, where Godzilla is actually melting down in that movie um, and is able so, to defeat Destroya because of it. Right. Uh, and the humans are worried because if he goes nuclear, then, you know, like have that could kill all life on the planet and stuff. Great stuff there. Um, but Burning Godzilla in this is just aces. And the weird, like, fire EMP wave that he starts to pulsate out. Like, his ultimate weapon is this this thing. And it just burns King Ghidorah to ashes. So incredible. This third act of this movie is just aces. Completely insane. It, uh, yeah, insane. This whole movie's insane. Like, it immediately drops you into the middle of Mothra being born as a larva. <laughs> so they ain't wasting time in this movie whatsoever not even a little bit but i uh, feel that pretty well covers the king of monsters do you have any major oh god last thing yes rotten tomato score for king of the monsters only a 42 percent wow really yeah critics were not a big fan of this one fans liked it godzilla fans really liked it again more Godzilla, everything they wanted out of Godzilla 2014. So only a 42%. I also should mention that this movie was kind of a box office failure. Yeah, it bombed. I mean, I, I like you saw it in theaters probably like three times, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw it three times in theaters. So I did, I tried to do my part to make sure this was a success. So, but, um, sorry. So now, um, themes. This is kind of a funny one because Godzilla just overall will always have theme of uh, nature and nuclear prol proliferation. That just comes with the territory. Even the bad Emmerich movie basically has those sort of. Right. But aside from the obvious, um, you were saying you feel a theme of parentage generally. Yeah. I think that goes through a lot of the... It's, it, not obviously this one when we talk about themes we almost have to leave out emmerich's film completely because it's such a standalone film that outside like you said of the basic godzilla themes of uh you know don't fuck with nature uh please don't use nuclear weapons uh, emmerich's film doesn't really attach itself to most anything um 
which is which is a part of its problem is it's kind of a heartless film. Uh, there's no soul to to Emmerich's film. But the other ones, again, like I mentioned in Godzilla 2014, you have to have a thing about dads uh, with Brian Cranston being kind of a, a missing dad, the Mutos having to nest, things like that. You also get in Kong Skull Island, his parents are dead. Kong's parents are distinctly dead. In fact, we get to see like like giant gorilla skulls at one point. Um you so you get that in there. You don't get a lot of the parenting in terms of the people, although one one character uh, played by Toby Kebble, who we forgot to mention him. God bless Toby Kebble. I love him. Um, you know, he's writing to his son at one point a letter and they make fun of him because they're like, that's all you're going to put in your letter. And he's like, yeah, but like I had to take another tour. Right. Like you get this idea of being kind of a, a parent that's not there. And then obviously in Godzilla King of the Monsters, you have a, a family that's split where the daughter has to choose between mom and dad because mom and dad cannot get along and they have such different viewpoints of the world on that. And then of course you also have like Godzilla being king and then Mothra being queen. There's this idea that they're trying to protect the earth. Uh, almost like they're the parents of this earth. They've been here longer than anybody else. And they're just trying to take care of it. And I think, so there's a lot of these weird, like running themes in this, these movies that I think that are really interesting in terms of parentage and guidance that, that I kind of like, I think that that's kind of the big theme for me that I wanted to mention for, you know, the, the monster verse in particular. Um, yeah, no, I think that, there is a lot going on in the monster verse, but it's more what you'd call like connective tissue or setup than theming per se. Um, Monarch and the cave paintings and stuff that's been mentioned a few times, but um, you know, sometimes the basic theme of don't mess with nature and maybe nukes are a bad idea. That can be enough. Um, I will say King of Monsters kind of spits in that idea being as the only way to save the day was by nuking Godzilla in a weird undersea city. Well, and I even think going into the nuclear armament thing of the Godzilla films is that these ones don't aren't necessarily because Godzilla is not created by nukes. Right. You know, that that is traditionally kind of accepted as an origin story for Godzilla, but he's he's attracted to the nukes and then the mutos eat the nukes you know so there's this idea that nuclear energy he's radioactive and whatnot but that that's you know as they explain in king of the monsters back in the back before the earth was fully formed the radiation levels were so much higher so th these are creatures that run on radiation more so than are like anti-nuclear which is an interesting change of theme from the original series um, I think it's kind of interesting that there's a little bit less in the way of merchandising on the later ones. Just not a thing you see in the same way anymore. You don't really see action figures and that kind of stuff. Um, although, weirdly, there is a three-part anime movie trilogy spinoff, sort of. Have you uh, seen it? The Netflix ones? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're something i i hated them yeah they're really honest bad. to god they're the i i think they're they might be my least three least favorite godzilla movies they're really dull they're so dull and like fucking nothing happens and it's and it's obvious that each it's almost meant to be more of a tv series like it's yeah. supposed to be three episodes because and like come on you made mecha godzilla a city i, I don't know i just i'm not Maybe I'm just more of a traditionalist in a lot of ways, but uh, when it comes to Godzilla, but uh, I was I was just not enthralled. Although it was interesting to see how they did King Ghidorah as more of an energy monster in the yeah. third one, so that was kind of interesting. But other than that, I was a uh, uh, I was not wholly impressed with those. So um, I suppose that leads us to what is your tops and bottoms for this? Mine. Uh, very easily is 98 is the worst um earnestly one of the worst movies of the 90s and i don't think it gets bashed nearly enough i'm really not kidding about that <laughs> um my number one is actually king of monsters it was kind of close between that and skull island but 
like I really liked King of Monsters for all the silliness and frivolity of the human part of the plot. Like the monster fights are just everything I have always wanted out of one of these movies. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, I'm gonna have to agree with you on worst. Godzilla '98 is a baffling film at best, uh, a terrible film at worst. Um, so many baffling things about that movie. My I'm going to have to go with my favorite out of these is Godzilla 2014. Really? I just think in terms of writing, it's a, it's a more well-rounded film. Now, as I mentioned before, Godzilla King of the Monsters is a movie I'm going to watch more. It's kind of like, I guess a good comparison for me is kind of like Godzilla King of the Monsters is more like the Kill Bill of this franchise. Sure, Kill Bill is the Quentin Tarantino movie I watch the most because I love the references. It's also kind of a sloppiest film because it's just full of references um so uh, it doesn't have the cohesion that i would want from it and godzilla king of the monsters is kind of that way to me yes do i love that there's easter eggs to it do i love that they go to an underwater city that you know may or may not be seatopia from fucking godzilla versus megalon yeah sure like and that's fucking cool right you know D- do i love that there's like weird elements from god like the giant ship it's you know kind of shaped like the original x1 from the 90s godzilla films yeah that's fucking cool right but you know it's just not as cohesive as i wanted between the monster fights and people work to it to have kind of the impact that i wanted it to so um although weirdly enough if i rank my godzilla films i might rank godzilla king of the monsters higher simply because of how much i enjoy watching it it's just a fun movie i can put it on in the background but i think godzilla 2014 ultimately is a better film King of Monsters has 100% more Mothra. Uh, I oh, I fucking hate you. Why do you have to do that to me? Mothra's, Mothra's my queen. All right. So uh, I think that about covers the American Godzilla's. Um, <laughs> the strictly American Godzilla's because technically the Ram and Burr inserted footage, I guess. Well, right. Well, yeah, because you have Godzilla King of the Monsters, and then technically the Godzilla 1985 um, is the American cut of that movie, because and they actually bring back Raymond Burr. <laughs> Do they really? Yeah. So <laughs> it's a weird sequel. Um, because the original the original Japanese cut is called Godzilla Returns. So, um, because it's a direct sequel to the original Godzilla film. So, um, kind of like right where they just keep treating it as the baseline and spinning off a bunch of different sequels to it. Oh my God. The, the millennium series of Godzilla is just a fucking shit show in terms of timeline because literally it is. It's like each one is a direct sequel to the original one that ignores the other millennium series films. That's insane. Yeah. It's, it's fucking nuts. So yeah. Yeah. I've, I saw somebody um, put together a um, timeline, like a, chronological order of all the godzilla films and it's a goddamn spider web it's so funny it's it's just ridiculous so but yeah so that kind of wraps up the american godzilla eye films um so you know i I hope everyone out there kind of enjoyed our discussion of it i sometimes i wish we could go even a little bit more in depth on some of these because i have a lot to say about these films you should see how many notes i took on godzilla 98 for this motherfucker uh i probably could have spent another two hours just bitching about that film but um you know hopefully everybody out there kind of enjoyed it we want to hear what you guys have to say about it so please uh don't hesitate uh reach out to us um, you know, you can listen to, obviously you'll be listening to this episode wherever you listen to your podcast episodes, but we have an entire back catalog, but visit us on social media too. We want to hear what you guys think. You know, what's your favorite American Godzilla film? What do you think? Is it a worthy franchise, uh, compared to the other franchise to compared to the Toho series or, or even the weird anime series? Like what, what the hell did you guys think about that? So, so, uh, get with us. We're on social media. You can reach us at facebook.com backslash no franchise franchise fatigue or over on twitter at nff pod so you can reach us there let us know what you like you can also email sean over let us know what other franchises you want to hit us at so uh, what's your email sean nff pod dot sean s-e-a-n at gmail.com my name is a four-letter word mm, yep yep the only other four-letter word that i call you 
<laughs> See, I reversed it that time. You thought I was going to say it again. Yeah. I normally say I call you other four letter words, but you know what? I'm only going to call you Sean. Um, so there is that. Then also you can feel free. You can follow myself, Matt Reifschneider, uh, over at Twitter at the movie Matt, uh, that my letter, my, my name is also a four letter word, M A T T not M A T. Um, so you can reach me there, uh, or you can also reach me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Matt Reifschneider. So feel free, uh, reach out to us. Let us know how everything is going. Uh, let us know what other franchise you want to you want to talk about. Let us know if there's, uh, any other, let us know if you want us to do the complete Godzilla franchise. Cause you know what? I'm more than happy to do it. We'll do I'm it. More th- I'm more than happy to do each film as a separate episode. <laughs> the Godzilla files. The Godzilla. <laughs> We're gonna make a whole s- sub podcast just based on Godzilla. We'll call it the sc- the Screonk Pod. <laughs> Scronk. Scronk Pod. Yep. So there's that. So yes. So thank you guys for listening. All right. So I think that'll do it. Um. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Have a great night, guys. All right.